right, everybody. I think we'll get rolling here. Uh, happy Monday. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. Uh, got outside a little bit, enjoyed some of the weather. Uh, today, we are going to go over our in-home, our new in-home workouts. And then we are also going to talk about sports conditioning. So specifically, um, cardiovascular types of conditioning for different sports and, and, and how those are set up and what it means uh, for each individual sport. So uh, let's get rolling. All right, so the new in-home strength training. Um, we'll have a video after this and we'll go over all these, but I just wanted to list them out. Starting with a lateral lunge, uh, 10 to 12 reps. We're gonna do a single leg RDL, uh, which is gonna be counterweighted. Uh, when we go to the video, I'll, uh, you'll see what that looks like. We're gonna be uh, rolling into some simple upper body exercises. Um, for the next two weeks, we're gonna give the shoulders just a little bit of a break. Um, we're going to be doing a dumbbell pullover at 10 to 12, um, lateral flies from 10 to 12, and then our core section, we're going to be looking at pistol bridges uh, for 12, and then some tension dead bugs for uh, 10 there. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, so this is a lateral lunge with a nice wide stance, toes pointing forward, dropping down to about that 90 degree. Dumbbell held in a goblet position, or obviously you can do a body weight. From the sides, so you just see how deep we're getting down and getting the butt down to that knee level each time. The single leg RDL counterweighted, it's gonna be in the same hand as the leg that's going back, keeping the core tight, a little bit of balance there. Uh, dumbbell pullover, we have two positions we can hold this dumbbell. This is position one, it's a little bit easier. And then this is position two, holding on the outsides, keeping the arms nice and straight for a nice workout in the lats there. Lateral fly, uh, I'm doing this with bands. Uh, it can also be done with light dumbbells. I just don't have any light dumbbells at the house right now. The pistol bridge. Looking for a nice squeeze in the glute and the low back here. And then a progression for this, you just raise uh, up on top of anything really. I'm using a weight here. And you'll feel a difference with that. Tension dead bug, get that nice exhale. Belly's tight, inhale on the out, exhale on the in. And that little bit of tension there just activates the upper cord just a little bit more than um, a standard bicycle style crunch there. All right, exit out of full screen here. You know, how do I get out of full screen here? There it is. Oops. All right. Make sure I still have my screen share on. I do not. All right, taking her back here. All right, so in-home conditioning uh, workouts. So these will be uh, some conditioning workouts that you guys can try out if you have access to a um, track, or again, if you don't have access to a track, you can just do this stuff on uh, the, and any, anywhere outside and just do the amount of time. Uh, the track day one, we'll start up with a half a mile jog, and then um, this is what I call uh, the one by four. Um, this is a, an interesting way of doing con conditioning. Um, this is a 100 meter sprint at around 15 seconds, followed by 10 seconds of rest, and then immediately into a 400 meter run with a 90 second rest. And then you would go back, it's just basically back and forth between these two, um, and it gives you a very... Um, very uh, contrasted uh, run. So the sprint is obviously short, um, and then that 400 meter run is that extended hard run. So just the back and forth between these with the short amount of rest, um, really, really good workout. It's one of my favorite to uh, run when I'm working with uh, athletes and group and stuff. All right. And track day two. We're looking at a warm up here. We'll do a little more of a, a dynamic warm up after our light jog, uh, high knees, butt kicks, high kicks, some walking lunges, and some inchworms. 
Um, and then we're going to do what's called a three mile pacer run. Uh, we actually talk about this one later in this presentation. Actually, I use it as an example. Um, this will be a half a mile slow jog or around five minutes. And that's like a, if you have a Fitbit or an Apple watch or anything like that, you can see your pace it would be a 10 mile, um, 10, 10 minute mile pace if you're looking at your watch, followed by a half a mile of a hard run around three minutes. And again, if you're using a watch, that'll be around a six minute mile pace. Um, and then we basically just repeat that three times until you get to um, three, three miles total. And then follow that the cool down for half a mile, followed by some stretching. All right, so those are the workouts for uh, the next two weeks that you guys can play around with. If you have any questions, you always let me know. All right, so let's move on to uh, sports conditioning. Um, so sports conditioning. Uh, one of the questions I get most from parents and athletes alike, I, I think someone asked it here actually last week, is like how much cardio should you be doing or how much running should you be doing for uh, X, Y, or Z sport? Um, the answer is very complicated, but my response is generally no miles because you really, unless you're doing a running sport, you don't really need to be uh, running any any continuous miles. Um, you know, so I have here, unless you're running uh, for like track or cross country, you shouldn't be running any amount of miles for your training. Um, you can do it for basic health reasons if you just like, um, you know, running, if it's for you. I mean, I personally love to run. It's very cathartic. Um, but if we're training for a particular sport, uh, you should limit the amount that you're doing, um, especially if you're in a training phase, like if you're in the off season uh, and you're really working on your conditioning. Um, so you should kind of keep away from it. It's it can be detrimental, especially if you're in like a power sport, um, anything that requires a lot of fast twitch muscles. So why do we want to stay away from that stuff? Um, the training effects on conditioning. So uh, the way you train affects the results just the exact same way um, as it does with strength training. You know, we talked about last week and a little bit the week before um, about setting up strength training programs, depending on what you're trying to do. So if you're looking to burn fat or become more conditioned, the workout's going to look a lot different than if you're looking to be a bodybuilder. Um, and the effects of conditioning workouts are exactly the same. A uh, baseball player training uh, with a marathon training program is not an effective way to become a baseball player or a baseball player. Um, this is a very extreme example that I'm using here, but I'll explain more why in a second. And obviously a marathon runner using a baseball conditioning program would not be an effective way to run and you probably would not finish the marathon. Um, the reason that is, is in basic terms, um, when you're training for a marathon, your extended runs for, you know, hours at a time. Uh, so your muscles, um, basically learn to, um, increase their endurance, you know, through, through that training muscles are at recycling um, the metabolism within themselves and they're able to go for longer and longer and longer. That's why if you're training for a marathon, you kind of build your way up slowly. Um, whereas for a baseball player, um, I think in like one of the first presentations we did, we, we talked about how much time or the distance that baseball players run per game. Uh, and it was three miles for uh, an average game. So baseball players don't really need a ton of conditioning in terms of uh, being better at baseball because there's just not a lot of running. Um, so most of their work, so like when I work with baseball teams and stuff on the conditioning end, you know, we do a little bit of conditioning just because it's good for uh, mental toughness training. Uh, but we keep the sprints very short. Um, we keep the rest times a little bit higher um, and just basically teach them to uh, be more explosive in their running as opposed to a marathon runner who needs to have the endurance. Obviously, endurance and explosiveness are the exact opposite ends of the athletic spectrum. All right, so two basic types of conditioning that, that we kind of work with. One of them is very basic, and the other one is ex uh, extremely complex. Um, but the first one is called steady state, and this is just training at a continuous state of uh, heart or breathing rate. Again, if you run with uh, any sort of monitor, that's easily trackable. Um, Basically, the breathing rate you would, if you're getting out of breath, if you're getting more and more out of breath, obviously that's not a steady state. Um, steady state training is good for general uh, fitness and heart health. Um, you know, so your your standard standard surgeon surgeon general's thirty minutes a day basic um, guideline of getting out there and staying healthy. Uh, and it's a good training method for running sports, for cross country, for track. Um, if you're in marathons or things like that, 
And like we said before, it trains the muscles for endurance, you know, to be able to last longer and longer. And then the second type is called interval training. This method, method uses uh, bouts of work and rest at varying intervals. So again, this is a big blanket term when I say interval training, because within interval training, there's um, thousands of things basically going on. Uh, in this type of training, this is what we use generally for sports, is good for mimicking a particular uh, sport and their demands within that sport. Um, it can be used uh, to train muscles for uh, explosive speed and rate of recovery, and it's also good for general health and fitness. And uh, this phrase here, rate of recovery, this is really what we're going for when, when we're doing interval training. Um, we're going to talk about a couple different sports here in a second. Basically, what we want to do is we want to get the athlete to a point where a game or a match is easy on the conditioning end of things. That, that's what I always strive for when I'm training my athletes. Um, and it's this rate of recovery, the ability to do a sprint, recover as fast as possible, and then do that sprint again at the exact same speed or the exact same intensity. Um, there's a drill that uh, I love to use. It's called the 300, uh, 300 yard shuttle. It's basically two cones 25 yards apart, and it's a six times down and back. This is the test that I use when I'm um, doing any evaluation for any athlete, and it gives me a very good sense of where they are um, in terms of their conditioning. And you basically do that six down and back. You, you get a time, we get a minute and a half rest and then you immediately do it again. And the people who are in uh, very good states of conditioning are gonna be able to hit that time or within three seconds of that time. So if they ran a minute 10 and they get a minute 13, I know that their anaerobic, their ability to be sports conditioned is pretty good. Um, and then you know obviously the athletes that are out of condition when they run a minute 10 and then they run a minute 40. Um, so those are the kids that I know that I need to spend more time with them on the condition, on the conditioning end of things. All right, so how do you choose which type of training? Um, basically, all comes back to what sport are you competing in or what is it you're training for? We've said this on multiple uh, occasions in these webinars, but it's basically you always need to know what it is you're trying to do before you can come up with any sort of plan. Um, for sports conditioning, um, I'm going to look at what is the lo what is the total load during a game. So what's the total distance that they're running or the time spent moving if they're a swimmer or something like that. Um, what's the duration and the distance covered during the active time versus the rest time. Uh, and what are the durations spent active um, to time not active. That's the work rest ratio. And then how long is any particular game or match. Uh, on top of that, Depending on, we're talking in season, out of season, how many times do competitions take place in a week? Um, obviously, in season, we're going to be limiting the amount of conditioning work we're doing because they're going to be get, getting most of their conditioning within the competitions. Um, and then what is the length of any given season? Um, and one of the things that, you know, I, I was a baseball player and I, I, I like to make fun of baseball when it comes to conditioning levels. Uh, but this is this is the length of the season for, for a baseball player is where the conditioning comes in uh, because it's your ability to last for that entire season, which is an enormously long season compared to other sports. All right, so we'll look at a couple different sports here uh, and how I would set up um, conditioning for that particular sport. Um, and again, I mean, for you know, anyone who's listening, who's playing soccer, who's playing lacrosse, who's playing tennis, um, any, any of the sports that we deal with within our company, this is, this is the time that you guys should be really, really beefing up your conditioning levels here because there's just no excuse not to. Uh, so soccer, obviously a match is 90 minutes unless it goes into overtime. Um, most players minus the goalie will run around seven miles in any particular match. And it's done with a variety of walking, jogging, and sprinting. Okay. Uh, your basic breakdown of your average match, this comes out to 92 minutes, so it's, it's within the margin of error here. Around 59 minutes is going to be walking or standing. Um, varies depending on your position. Uh, 25 minutes is going to be a jog, and around 8 minutes is going to be sprinting. Uh, this basically works out with these two to here, the 25 and the 8 to the 59. It's a 1 to 2 work-rest ratio. 
So for every one second they're working or every one minute they're working, they're resting for two. And that's very important with um, putting together a workout for them. So before we show some of the sample workouts, um, general rules for the workout when I'm designing stuff for teams or for uh, individuals who are looking to become more fit. Um, I'm going to try to make, the, and this will vary again in season, out of season. I'm going to make the total duration of the workout about a third or less of the match or the game time. Uh, so for soccer, obviously a 90 minute match, um, I'm going to be looking at a workout that's going to be 25, 30 minutes or maybe a little bit less. Um, just because I don't want to be mimicking the actual game load, we'll get into why that is in a, in a minute. But we just don't want to overload the body. Like if they have two matches a week and we're, you know, like in preseason stuff and they're building their way up, I don't want to have three to four days of uh, extra training where they're doing another game. It just becomes too much for the body. Um, the total distance should be somewhere around 75% of what the game or match is going to require. So for most soccer teams, when I plan out conditioning stuff, I usually try to get them to about five miles. Um, when I'm working with tennis players, we'll see, I usually try to get around two, two and a half miles. Um, and an ex so the example for soccer would be basically if they're an out of season, I'd be doing two to three days of conditioning work. Soccer is um, very high on the conditioning side. This tends to be some of the most fit athletes in the world are going to be playing soccer. Um, I know a lot of people argue that it's water polo, um, but that's just not widely done enough for me to give it any credence. Uh, and then once we're in season, depending on the number of matches that these players are going to have, maybe one day or maybe once every two weeks. All right. So a basic uh, example of what, of what a workout is going to look like for I'm a soccer team that, that I would design. Um, need to look at how, how far is an average sprint in um, a soccer match. And it's usually around 10 meters. Um, and then the work to rest ratio is one to two. So I'm going to condense my workout down to 25, 30 minutes. I need to basically flip all of those on their head. So I'm going to make them sprint a little bit further at 100 meters. Give them 15 second rest. Or, or at around 15 seconds, and then just give them 15 seconds of rest. Okay, so that's a one to one. So I've completely flipped their work to rest ratio. So now that when we're training this way, that recovery time um, that we're talking about comes back a little bit stronger each time we do this. So like four, four weeks into training like this, I would expect all of my athletes to be hitting that 15 second mark on all 10 reps, right? I'd basically give them um, a set break of three minutes. And then I would do all of that five times through. So they would do five sets of 10 hundred meter sprints. Um, and I've actually run this workout with soccer players and with some of our soccer teams. Um, this particular workout is extremely effective um, and it just really gets the kids in good shape. And you know, you, you, you could play around with these distances and stuff. I just wanted to give you a sense of why I would pick 100 meters, why we'd want it at 15 seconds, and why I'd only give them 15 seconds of rest, right? So all in all, they're going to get up to um, a little over three, three miles on this particular run. Um, and just playing around with those work to rest ratios is really where the training is done. Uh, because again, we want to mimic what, what they're doing during their sport. So they're sprinting, they're resting, they're sprinting, they're resting. All right, let's look at uh, tennis when I'm setting things up for tennis. So match time varies, but uh, an average for men, because they play more sets than women do, if, if, if you don't watch tennis, is around three and a half hours. Uh, women is around two and a half to two hours, and average distance covered is going to be around three miles. Um, a few years ago, we did a very extensive kind of uh, study with our full-time players for our, um, for our tennis program. And uh, we had them hooked up to GPS and like heart rate monitors and stuff. And it was for a match. They always came in either a little under three um, and never really went over five uh, for training. Um, that's when like the real miles got covered, it, like in a two to three hour uh, training session, they were upward of like seven miles. Obviously, we're not dealing with that. 
for dealing with mimicking the matches. Um, the average point in tennis is going to be under 10 seconds. If you've ever watched tennis, um, you know, the vast majority is going to be one to two back and forths, maybe. Um, and the average time between points is around 20. I think the max they have is it's 25 seconds. Basically, the serve has to come in. Uh, and then they have the changeover where they go sit down and the little kid brings them a water and they get banned. Uh, that's 90 seconds. So when you average all of this up, your overall work to rest is around one to five. So for every one minute, you're resting five. Um, obviously, the duration is pretty long for tennis, but there is a lot of rest going on. Um, so an example workout for them, uh, and this again is, is a workout uh, many times with the, with our tennis athletes when we were able to be out there on the uh, tracks um, would be a 200 meter sprint looking for around a 30 second uh, time on that the one minute rest and we do that 12 times um, 30 seconds to one minute obviously that is a one to two right so that's way different than a one to five and again it's just taking our work to rest ratios during our matches and bringing it way down or condensing it way down so that uh, your recovery time becomes a lot quicker. So if I'm able to do this 200 meters at 30 seconds with a one minute rest, I'm, I'm able to hit that 30 second timer under every single time. Going into your next match, even though this might only take 25 minutes, going into your next match that's three and a half hours long, you should be to the point where your recovery is so good um, that you are just going to be much better prepared for that three and a half, four hour long match. That's because of a workout that only took 20, 20 25 minutes. Um, I mean, I, I know this to be absolutely true. Um, it's because one of the things, uh, you know, our initial crop of full-time um, tennis players about seven or eight years ago, um, I really, really hammered on them with the conditioning work. And they were known around the area and around the country um, for just being the fittest kids because uh, they would literally wear people out during matches just because they would not get tired and other kids did. So very important, the, the conditioning end of things, and it often gets overlooked, unfortunately. All right, so uh, cross country. Obviously, cross country uh, is uh, 3.10265 or something like that miles. It's a five-kilometer race. Um, your average times are going to be around 16 to 20 minutes. Some kids go under 16, some kids go over 20, but that's the average amount of time that's going to be spent during a race. And the course uh, will, will, will have elevation and terrain changes. Um, most people think of cross country as kind of um, a steady state thing, like you're just out there running. Um, but if you've ever run cross country or run on cross country courses, the mix of the steady, it basically becomes a mix of steady state and intervals because of hills. Um, so basically, anytime you're going up a hill, that would, even though you're not sprinting, the level of um, cardiovascular needs, the heart rate, your breathing rate, are going to go way up to the point where it almost mimics sprinting. And then downhills basically become um, our rest period. So it's, cross country is actually, you know, a interval style of running, even though most people don't think about it. Um, so an example and this would be a workout that I've done many, many times when I ran cross country in high school. Um, day one would be 400 meters, so one lap run at 90 seconds, trying to make that in a minute and a half. It's a rest ratio of one, one to one, 90 second rest, trying to hit that at 10. Um, and I can tell you that's a very, very tough workout. Day two would be a 100 meter hill sprint times 20, you know, so find a nice hill measure out 100 meters, print up that thing as fast as you can, I'll get back down 20 times back and forth. This is probably the best way to train for um, like cross country style races or marathon, um, besides like your long distance runs. Um, you know, hitting this hill sprints is absolutely key to being good at that style of running. And again, it's a very different style of running than just like regular track running for sprints. Um, the muscles, needed during hill sprints are very, very different uh, than just like flat track running. So like how we set these workouts up is very, very important to any, to any particular sport. Uh, and then day three, uh, we'd run as a three mile pacer run, which we talked about in the beginning that that's the workout that's actually happening uh, for the next two weeks. 
for those of you who are going to partake in that. And it's basically a half a mile in half a mile interval of jogging and hard running back and forth, back and forth. These are generally done best uh, either on a track or on a flat surface. Um, if you have like a long street that you can use that's nice and flat, that's the best way to do that. Uh, again, because we don't want to have the, the hills in there, which basically kind of mess up our in the intervals because it basically becomes a sprint. Right. And then basically our, our conclusions here. Um, sport is going to dictate how we train for conditioning and mimicking those work to rest ratios and even reducing them is where we're going to get the best results. And training improperly, uh, training the improper way, oh, I realize it's a misspelling off to correct that, uh, can result in not getting the proper results. Um, and your muscles and your cardiovascular system will respond differently in different types of training. Um, so, I mean, think about it in, in, in these terms. Uh, if you have, you know, if you picture a marathon or in, in your head, um, you know, you're going to picture generally tall and a lanky uh, looking person, you know, for the, for the very, very elite ones. Uh, and then if you think about a sprinter, um, you know, what does their body look like versus a marathoner's body? Now, this is a bit of a chicken of an egg, chicken and egg situation. What came first? skinny kid's body or his uh, efficiency at running marathons. Um, it's a little bit of both. So generally, you know, all skinny people are not going to be sprinters uh, and muscular athletic people are not going to be distance runners because the makeup of the muscular system is just not built to do the different types of things. Um, you know, so if you, if you have someone, even like, um, I remember when Lance Armstrong run, ran his first marathon, um, you know, he got into the New York marathon, I believe it was, this was before all the, all, all the things went down with him. I mean, he, you know, he was at the top of his game, you know, he cheated there, but whatever he, he was at the top of his game for cycling, right? So his body was trained for cycling. His cardiovascular system was trained for those styles of, uh, of work to rest ratios, downhill, uphill, um, coasting, actually pedaling and stuff. And he ran, um, the New York, uh, or the New York marathon and every, everyone thought he was going to be fantastic at it. Um, he was not, <laughs> his body is just, was not built for that style of training. You think of long distance biking and long distance running as kind of two peas in the pod, but they're completely, completely different. Um, and knowing that and setting your training up properly to know that is the only way you're going to get as possible results. Um, so watching, you know, another example of this was watching the last dance again, uh, last night. And when MJ went to play baseball, he spent, um, you know, basically 18 months training as a baseball player. And then the baseball, uh, MLB went on strike and he just started going back to basketball and he was not ready for it. Like his body was just not prepared. He wasn't training the same way he used to. Um, so keeping those things in mind, you know, if you're working with your, uh, your kids or you, you yourself are an athlete, how you train, how you condition your body is going to have huge results on what you're going to look like on the field. Um, so after that, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll pull up the chat here real quick. And again, um, as we look to rest of this week and next week. If there's anything in particular you guys want to hear about, um, feel free to reach out to me, uh, Tim at centercourtclub.com. I'd be happy to cover any subject that's of interest to anyone, um, as long as it's a, a broad enough topic that, you know, everyone will get uh, some use out of it. Uh, do you personalize training for tennis athletes? Hey, Conrad, how are we doing? Um, so personalized training for tennis athletes, do you mean in the conditioning style? So like when I'm setting up conditioning yeah, workouts? Right, Tim, yeah, sorry, I thought it would probably easy to just talk to you. Um, yeah. I'm interested in, you know, individual game style development of tennis athletes. So you've got players who are lightning fast on a forward and backward plane, and we know mm -hmm. that in tennis, you know, 30% of movement is in that direction. Lateral, yeah. Um, you know, 70% going sideways. But yeah. the point is that the players who, let's call it um, a fast vertical runner, 
that's trying to play a baseline, um, you know, game, a defensive or not, let's call it a counter-punching baseline counter game. Counter-puncher, yeah. yeah. Would you, in your fitness, would you, um, obviously you work with us and the coaches, but would you personalise what they're doing to kind of uh, make them improve in that game that, that we want them to play? Or would you just enhance what they currently do well and try to change the game style according to physical attributes? Sure. So I think the, the best way to answer that would, would be to say when we're dealing with junior level athletes, which is, is, is kind of the, the, the push of what I'm doing here, you kind of have to lump everyone a little bit when you're setting up the, the conditioning work. Um, I think when you get to a level – um, you know, like where if you're dealing with a professional athlete and they have a particular style of game, I think that's when you get to the granule level and that's when you start changing, um, you know, like for someone uh, like a Nadal who's a bit more of like a powerful player versus um, Federer who's a bit more kind of that uh, skilled-ish player. I think I would set up their conditioning workouts pretty differently um, in terms of like that junior level. I just don't think they're – Junior level, like they're not conditioned enough at this point to get down to that granular changes that, that you would need to do. Um, you know, because the gains are going to be made no matter how we train them, as long as we're training them playing around with those work to rest ratios for tennis players. If that answers. Great answer. Thanks a lot, Tim. Appreciate it. No problem. All right, I'll leave it another uh, seconder here if anybody else has anything. Uh, Tim, could I get, get a question in? Sure. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, as far as uh, quickness goes, like Jimmy Connors was extremely quick from, from um, stationary. Um, to, uh, can juniors or can players increase their speed or is it, it a certain – is, or is it or you're very limited just by your so physical – there is there is wiggle room within any mm. athlete to make them – you know, faster, mm -hmm. um, whole speed and agility section of my business is very hard for mm -hmm. me because as a, as a, um, as an industry, we place such a huge amount on selling these speed and agility style workouts. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, when you understand the actual science around what's going on inside of muscles, there's a very small, um, okay. window that we're actually going to be able to move anyone. Mm -hmm. Um, makeup of your muscles is the makeup of your muscles. There's some research out there that says that there's a certain type of muscle fiber that we can change from slow twitch to fast twitch, which is basically, you know, an endurance muscle to a fast muscle. Um, it's very small. Um, mm -hmm. It hasn't really been proven for like the most part. So what we spend the most amount of time on when it comes to quickness is teaching proper footwork. So mm -hmm getting them to the point where they understand exactly where their feet need to be faster or, or the reaction time, basically okay. them to be a little bit quicker. Okay. Um, but in, but in terms of like, can I take a kid um, that looks like a marathon runner and make him super fast twitch and really, really quick on the court, mm -hmm. it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. So okay. hope that answers. So Nadal and Federer, I mean, to me, they look like they have very, very fast twitch muscles. Would that be true to say that? Yeah, I mean, most most tennis tennis is 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 a power sport. So so the people who are really good at tennis generally tend to be very fast twitch dominated. Okay. Um, you know, even even someone um, like Djokovic, who looks kind of like long and lanky, uh -huh. is extremely powerful and extremely fast twitch. And right. I mean, you know, right. someone like. Serena, obviously, who dominated the women's game is just because she's more powerful than everyone. You know, so power, fast twitch, all of those things kind of go together. Okay, thanks. No problem. All right, everybody. Like I said, if there's anything you guys want to hear about uh, coming up, let me know. And uh, have a great week. Take care. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tim.